All right, we can get started. So welcome to lesson 10, Genomes and Manipulating the Genome. Uh, just a reminder, I'm recording this component of the office hours just as a lesson, and I will post it up to the channel that I shared with you all just to kind of give you all access to it. So that way, people who are not here will still have access to the information of the lesson. So I'm going to look at the first half of this lesson today with you all, and then tomorrow we'll kind of look at the second half and talk about some of the more finer details about genome manipulating and uh, how it works. So uh, if you have questions, just hang tight until I finish the lesson component and stop recording, and I'll be more than happy to answer them. If you want to write a little star by something you have a question on, then uh, you can ask it afterwards. So what is the genome and what is manipulating the genome? And how does it fit into what we've learned so far this unit? So the Human Genome Project uh, looked to sequence all of the bases that make up every single human chromosome. When you think about the A, T, C, G, all those nucleotides and, and bases that make up the human chromosome, the Human Genome Project wanted to sequence them all for everyone in some capacity. It started in 1990, came more involved in the 2000s. It's a publicly funded venture. And it's kind of like a race to, to see who could do it. Several private companies joined that race in 1998 and they wanted to try to sell the information in some way, which is a little bit spooky. I and mean, we'll research a little bit more about that as we move throughout this uh, and next unit. And today we have about 3 billion base pairs coded. So, or we understand 3 billion base pairs worth of information on the human genome. So it's kind of important in the context of how we learned about genetics as a whole, because when we look at how different alleles make different traits and how those traits are passed on, we're now starting to understand how specific genes are grouped and how they create that allele and how they create that continuous versus discontinuous uh, inheritance pattern that we saw throughout this entire unit. And we can start to look at specifics with regards to coding and non-coding DNA. So coding DNA, as you could kind of guess, it kind of refers to the sequences or the genes that produce a specific protein that lead to specific phenotypes, which allow for those traits to be expressed. Only about 29% of bases are what's called coding. Sorry, 2%. 2% of bases are coding. So when you think about the billions of DNA bases that we have in our chromosome, only 2%, only 2% are used for coding. So that's with regards to coding DNA. And as you can imagine with non-coding DNA, it's sequences that do not code for specific proteins. That's 98% of the genome. Those are what's called telomeres and centromeres, which we don't have to get into too much detail now. Oops. But at the end of the day, telomeres kind of are the caps at the end of our genes or at the end of our chromosomes. And the centromeres are what help to wind everything up. So that's the, the two main types of DNA that we have that coding and non-coding DNA. And that's all we really need to worry about with regards to that. Some other genome information that we can talk about is that the number of genes is not proportionate to the genome size. Each gene in different organisms is a different length and it's varied as a result of the species and those environmental factors, which we will look at more in next unit. So the functional genomics, what is the genome good for? How do we understand the genome as a whole and what can we utilize it for? So functional genomics is the research being done beyond just knowing the human genome sequence. It helps discover the function and importance of each gene, allows for us uh, a way to treat genetic disorders through gene therapy, and it allows for what's called genetic engineering, something that you'll do a bit more research today and tomorrow and a little bit in the next coming unit as well as for your project that we assign at the end of that unit. But we'll get there when we get there. And then the last thing I want to talk about today is something called DNA fingerprinting. Uh, DNA fingerprinting is just the examination or the examining of an individual's unique DNA sequences. When you look at that sidebar to the right there of that crime scene, that's the DNA that was taken at the crime scene. And then there were three suspects that they sequenced using DNA fingerprinting and they determined that suspect two's DNA matched the crime scene DNA. So it can kind of help prove or disprove innocence. And these forensic detectives, they perform multiple tests, and this is how they compare what's found at the crime scene versus what the suspect might have or might have given to him. So gel electrophoresis is a way to separate DNA by size. 
and looking for specific patterns or similarities. Again, just like that DNA fingerprinting, this allows for that to happen. I'll talk a little. I'll talk a little bit about the basics of genetic engineering. And then I will do the rest tomorrow because I want to give some people uh, the opportunity to work through it on their own as well as read through it and ask questions. So what is genetic engineering? Well, it's the ability to change the genome of an organism and it involves using techniques to produce what's called recombinant DNA. This is DNA from multiple sources, DNA from multiple sources. And this is where it starts to get a little cool. We don't really spend too, too much time talking about it in this class, but you will a little bit in grade 12 as well as in your undergraduate studies. So there are two basic tools with which DNA can be recombined from multiple sources. The first is plasmids. Those plasmids are small circular chromosomes in bacterial cells with a known sequence. They can help with combinations and recombinant DNAs. And then something called restrictive enzymes. These restrictive enzymes are like DNA scissors. They cut DNA at specific points and they allow for the insertion of different plasmids or different pieces of DNA into that genome. So tomorrow we'll look at how insulin is produced in humans, as well as how we make insulin using recombinant DNAs tomorrow.